and uh, we're very, very happy that you made it. And I'm going to start with just brief bio that I'm sure everybody read, but just as a reminder. So Marian is a master's certified coach, has been since 2006, and a professional certified coach since 1998. Marian currently teaches her own unique ICF approved coach training program, Laser Coach Your Way to Sustainable Success, emphasizing masterful coaching skills. Marian's book that you can see in behind her where she sits right there, mm -hmm. The Heart of Laser Focused Coaching, a revolutionary approach to masterful coaching, was written for coaches at all experience levels. She created and fa facilitated ongoing weekly group mentor practicums, Coach with Confidence, offering certification, preparation, ICFCCUs, and Marcia has it right there. Awesome. Uh, Marion enjoys mentoring and preparing coaches for the ACC, PCC, or MCC certification with a 100% success rate that, thus far. So whoever needs it, keep in mind. <laughs> her wisdom and insight are evident through her ebook, audiobook, Life's Little Lessons, and Coach Camp's audios. Marion maintains individual coaching clients and is in demand for her laser approach and direct style of coaching. Marion has been interviewed on television for her coaching expertise, has been a featured presenter, and was cited in the Wall Street Journal. And we are very lucky that she found time in her tight schedule and came to us today. So Marion, please, by all means, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for all of you who have chosen to be here, thank you. And what I would really, really, really love, I know most of you don't, but I would love it if you would turn your cameras on so I can actually feel like I'm talking to people um, because, you know, the yeah, I, even though we're, we're doing Hollywood squares, I still like... <laughs> I still like to feel like I can see people and I can see your reactions and your, you know, like if you're bored or, you know, I, I like to know what's happening. So, um, so for those who um, have heard me speak, you, you know that I always start the same way for every presentation. Um, and for those who haven't, you're going to hear it now anyway. Um, and that is what I share. Uh, is not necessarily uh, the right way of doing coaching. It's not necessarily the best way. And it's not necessarily the, and it's certainly not the only way. Um, but what I want is for people to be open, open to trying things in a different way, because I have been doing this for a really long time and have literally listened to thousands of coaching conversations and recordings. And what I share comes from my experience. And it very often is very contradictory to what people learn in coach training and very often is very different and sometimes it could be just a reminder, but basically what I really, really invite you to do is just to be open and willing to try new things, okay? And so with that, what I would like to do is start with a question and I really would appreciate if you could actually turn yourself on if you're can um, and and um, and to answer the question because it's an easy one um, <laughs> and to answer the question and we want to hear I want really want to hear from a lot of people because that's really helpful um, for everybody so let me start with the question instead of teasing you um, <laughs> and that is what do you think in your opinion what makes coaching masterful versus mediocre? So what are some of the things that you think make it really masterful? Bobette, yay, hi, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, I think what makes masterful coaching is being able to create a relationship and a connection with your client. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Okay. Okay. 
listening without judgment. Okay. Having curiosity. I'm sorry. Having curiosity. Yes. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Marion is when we, when in a coaching session, when we get that moment where the, 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 the client stops and it takes a time to to answer so it goes really deep in what is really true that's for me the yeah excellent okay uh not being attached to the outcome yeah easy words what yeah. <laughs> um when we're in flow dancing in the moment yes what when else client has some kind of a discovery moment an aha moment yeah, I think that's kind of what Marcia was was referring to. Yes. Um, however, we need to keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily mean we're doing masterful coaching. So here's why. Because if I'm listening as an assessor or observer and the client pretty much, I'm going to put in quotes, close, um, coaches themselves and comes to some amazing realization it may not be because of what I asked or what I've done as a coach. So you wouldn't even get, I mean, I'm just saying you wouldn't even get credit. So just to keep in mind that when they have these aha moments or big discoveries, it's really looking back and saying, was that because of something I said or asked? Okay, good. All right, what else? So what makes it masterful besides the things that you've said, the provocational aspect of coaching? I don't know what that means, Alexandra. Where are you? You want to speak? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so what I, what I mean, what I mean is uh, for, for me, what makes masterful is exactly what, what you are saying. Uh, the, the provocations we, uh, we do with our clients and when, when, whenever we, we reach out to a point that that makes a difference, that's mm -hmm. masterful for me. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Susan, yeah, getting to the core. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, did uh, yeah I, I, I think it all, it all comes down to really being a good listener and that the connection comes from being a good listener. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people think they are good listeners, but if they are really not listening. <laughs> and... And, and, and I'm a journalist, so I work a lot with the listening to what people are not saying. So then the next question will come from what they are not saying. And I think that's what makes you a masterful coach. Good. Okay. So, Hermie, um, you're saying ask the right question. So let me just say, and, and people get nuts when I say this, there is no such thing. How's that? And I say that because sometimes the simplest, shortest question can be the most powerful question of the entire conversation. And it, it could be, and I, I know I put this in the book where I, it could be, and what does that mean for you? That could be the most pivotal question of the entire conversation and there's nothing special about it. So by thinking that we have to have these right questions or good questions, it kind of screws up the coaching because there really is no such thing. The question, and we'll get into how to make them powerful no matter what, um, or make them, you know, have a great impact. But in general, if, you know, I don't want people to get stuck on, I have to have the right question just so, you know, I'm just pointing that out. Yeah, I'm sorry if I misspoke. I didn't say right questions or good questions. I said the questions no, coming no. from what? Like, oh, oh. It was somebody else. No, it was somebody else. Oh, okay. Else. No, I know. Yeah, you, so, said, you said from what's not being said. Yeah, so that's what I said, the right questions. But the right questions could just be a reflection. It could yes. be anything that's appropriate for the moment. Yes. But it's Perfect. relevant at yep. the time. Yep, yep, exactly. Great. Okay, Um. And I'm just curious, um, maybe you can, I don't know, unmute yourselves and just say, how many people have actually read the book? That's what I'm kind of curious about. I'm just about to start. I've got it recently. It's okay. the next one. Okay. Anyone? Okay. 
I'm just asking. I, I started to, not, okay. not entirely read. Okay, okay. Well, I know Bobette has. <laughs> well, even before it was really the book. <laughs> Well, anyway, okay, so what I want to uh, what I want to do now is tell you some of the things that I think make the coaching masterful aside from yeah, Thomas Leonard's laser coaching, of course. Um, aside from the things that you've said, I'm going to add some things. So one is that we need to go deeper versus broader. And people say, yeah, well, we kind of know that, but what does that really mean? And what it really means is that you never let anything go. And, and that means that the, the most amazing little things they could say, you pick up on that. You, know, you don't let things go. So when the client says, I found it really challenging because you know this happened and that happened and you're thinking to yourself, oh yeah, that would be challenging. No, you have to ask. What made that challenging for you? You see where I'm saying you don't let go of anything. You want to dig in. So that's how you start to go deeper. Now, everybody has heard you coach the who, not the what. And then everyone says, yeah, well, that's a great expression. And I sort of think I know what it means. But what it really means, and here's how it goes to, speaks to the questions you ask. Every question you ask should be about the person, the client themselves, nothing about the story. So I'm gonna say unequivocally, I actually have the nails on the chalkboard when I hear tell me more, because tell me more has two bad things for me. One is you don't need the information. You absolutely do not. And the second thing is it's a command. Tell me more. Like I'm in charge of you in a way. So if anything, it's what else can you say about that? But nevertheless, I still say you never need more information. You need to understand who is this person? How do they think? What are they believing? What do they, how do they operate? What goes through their mind? You're trying to figure out who they are. That's the job and that's what helps to get to the who part. Okay. Somebody mentioned not attached to results. A lot of people worry, especially new coaches, you know, is this gonna be okay? Am I gonna hopefully get someplace? Well, I'm gonna tell you, absolutely positively as an MCC who's been doing this for a billion years, I still have moments of, oh my gosh, I have no idea what this is about. I have no idea where we're going. And that's part of what makes masterful coaching is that you're not concerned about getting someplace. So just putting that out there. Um, the other, another thing is that the conversation is supposed to sound really natural. There's no jargon. We learn a lot of jargon in coach training, but when I say natural, I mean really natural. Like the conversation you would have with your friend, with your parent, with your spouse, with your uh, child, natural. The only difference should be that you're not doing a lot of the talking. That really should be the only difference. You should not sound what I'm gonna put in quotes, coach-like. Because if you sound coach-like, you're playing a role and it's supposed to be a partnership where you and your client are working together to figure out what's going on. So as natural as possible, no crazy expressions, um, now, if they use a weird expression, then you do have to use that expression, even if it's not yours. So for example, somebody says, I took a photograph, but your word is, I took a picture. Then you have to use the word photograph because you don't want them to, to have to interpret anything. But in general, keep the language as simplistic as you can, okay? 
there should be no evidence of any kind of formula. The conversation should be as natural as any conversation goes. Where you got your training should not be evident. And I can tell you that very often I listen to a coaching conversation. I say, I know where that person got training. That's not okay. <laughs> it shouldn't be evident because what happens, and this is the part people don't get, when, you when people take coach training, they get a way to coach. And it's usually, a, I want to say, a formula or a system or a method. But in truth, when you want to be really masterful, all that go should go out the window. And you just literally listen and get curious. That's really how it's supposed to go by the time you get more comfortable. Uh, you never ignore the by the way comments. I hear this so often. So in the book, I put a specific example, um, but I'm gonna do it you know, now how it actually occurred in the actual call because in the book I had to you know, maneuver and mesh and you know, make up things and whatever. But the actual person came to the call and this part I did put in, she came to the call and she said, you know, I'm, I'm feeling kind of vulnerable and this is gonna be really a little difficult for me to share. And she said, my, my, um, my child at school is having a problem. And what I'm trying to figure out and what I need your help with is to figure out should I get a teacher that's in the school? Would that make more sense than getting somebody who's not involved, somebody on the outside? So that's really what I want help with. You know, what should I do in terms of finding the right teacher for my child? And my first question was, anybody have any idea what it could have been? What do you think you believe you should do? What would you like to do? No, anyone? No, you'll see why. Anyone have an idea? What are some other options? No. Why does that matter? No. What is important <laughs> to you? What do you think your kid would prefer? Not Why even are you close. Me? I'm sorry, Babette, what'd you say? Why are you asking me? Okay. Actually, my first question was, what is making this so vulnerable and difficult to share? That was the by the way comment that we don't ignore. As it turned out, it had nothing to do with picking the right teacher. That's how you do the, the masterful stuff is you don't let anything go. Why did she have a need to tell me that she was feeling vulnerable and that it was difficult for her to share? Well, it turned out that because the first question was, what is making this so vulnerable and difficult? it wound up being the basis for the conversation, which is she was very worried and concerned that there was something really wrong with her child. That was the real concern. It had nothing to do with picking the right teacher. So can you hear how, and think back now to conversations where there was this little by the way comment that came up and you just kind of went on, right? but you have to pick up on those. And then um, I wanna just share something that I have dubbed nosy curiosity versus coaching curiosity. Cause everybody says you have to be curious as a coach, right? Well, when you're curious with a friend, it's a little different than when you're curious as a coach because if someone comes to you and says, um, 
you know, I was just so upset after he told me what he said. I mean, that was just awful. And the coaches, well, what did he say? Whose curiosity is that? That's the coach's curiosity. That's nose. I mean, that's nosy curiosity, right? You want to know, oh, what happened? What did he say? Because now we're sucked into the story, right? That's the juicy part. Instead, what was it like for you when you heard that? Whatever it was, right? I want to understand this person and what, what's creating this reaction. Not what did, and the reason that I don't want to know what that person said because the client already knows the answer. They know what was said to them. And that makes it, quote unquote, a bad question. If they already know the answer, then it's your nosy curiosity. Is that making sense? Yes. Right? Yeah. And if it's something that you're curious about, like, so what was that like for you when you heard it? I am trying to understand this person. That's the who part. Right. And that's something that that person has probably not really thought about. Well, you know, at first I was upset, but then when I thought about it, I'm going to get great information. Okay. All right. So I have come up with two questions that you always want to hold in mind when you speak with anyone. So it doesn't have to be a client. It could be anyone in your home, anyone that you're with in any way, shape, or form. And the two questions to hold in mind, but not actually ask. One is, why is this person telling me this? Why did that person have a need? This is why I picked up on it. Why does this person have a need to tell me it was vulnerable and hard to share? Because I'm listening for why, why did she say that, right? So what make, why does somebody tell me something? There's something they want from it. So that's the part we want to question. And the other question is what makes it a problem for this person? And that's really important. Like what makes it a problem for this person? Because think about this, Bobette and I have lunch plans. And I say, Bobette, you pick the best restaurant you wanna go to and the, and the most fun one for you and anyone you wanna go to, and that's where we'll go. And so Bobette picks a great restaurant about a half an hour and she, you know and we we're now about 3 weeks you know out to the date we make about a half an hour before we're ready to meet i call bobette and i say you know what i'm really sorry but i'm just not feeling right and we're going to have to postpone and bobette says oh mary i was really looking forward to that i can't believe you can't do it are you sure you don't feel good enough to do it i was so excited about going now i have the exact same plan with chris we are planning to go to lunch exact same story and about a half an hour before i call you and say you know i'm really sorry but i just i can't do it and chris says no problem we'll just reschedule can you see how everybody takes the same circumstances and deals with them so differently? So therefore, what makes it a problem for this person? So what made it a problem for Bobette that I had to cancel and it wasn't a problem for Chris? What, what, so that would be my curiosity. What's so upsetting about the fact that we have to postpone? Well, because you know what, growing up, I always had that kind of disappointment. I always had people canceling at the last minute and I got to feel really bad about making appointments, you know, whatever. I'm gonna get great information. <laughs> That's my point, okay? Okay. So 
And as I'm going here, if you have questions, by all means, please put them in the chat or I would love it if you would show your face and raise your hand and take yourself off mute and speak. <laughs> it would be really, really cool. <laughs> okay. So um, what are we listening for? We're listening for everything that we can try to understand about the person, not the situation. We don't need to know any more about the situation. My boss is horrendous. He's terrible. He does this. He does that. I can't stand him. That's all we need to know. It's a bad relationship. That's it. That's all we need to know. Now, I have a whole chapter in the book, and it is Do Not Believe the Client. And I was going to name the book, Don't Believe the Client, but um, I didn't think anybody would buy it. Um, <laughs> so what do I mean by don't believe the client? Do not believe the client. Because 95% of what they tell us is their perception. It's not necessarily the truth. So when the client says, you know, if I leave this job, I'll never be happy again. Do we know that as a fact? No. If I stop exercising, I will get fat. Really? Do we know that? No. It's not a fact. Uh, if I share my feelings, he will leave me. Really? Do we know that? These are perceptions that people have that they give us. And I say, yay, that they've given it to us because now we have something to work with. So when I say don't believe the client, what I'm really saying is don't take what they give you at face value. It may be true. It may absolutely be the truth. So, and then there are exceptions. So for example, um, the person says, you know, every day growing up, my father beat me. Well, we don't really have to know, was it literally 365 days a year or was it just, you know, once a week? It doesn't matter. We know it was a crappy childhood. That's all we need to know. But in general, people have ideas. And that's what we call in coaching beliefs, right? We, they have ideas or thoughts about things that they believe are true. And what I'm saying to you is, it may not really be the truth. Um, does the truth matter in a client? Or what really matters is their truth. That's exactly right. What is true for them? But by the same token, Chris, what they think is true may not be. That's the key, is that we're going to question it. Not that we're calling them liars, not that we're saying, oh my God, how could you even think that? But rather, we are questioning, wait a second, you don't really know for sure. Let's look at what, my, what else could be going on here or what else could be possible. Okay. Um, I like to talk about the 1% and, and everybody says, what's the 1%? When a client says, I've almost got it the way I need it to be, or it's almost great. And I wanna know what's the missing piece? And why do I wanna know what the missing piece is? Because that's where the coaching goes. So if somebody says, I'm 99% sure, I'm going to ask, what's the missing 1%? What is it? What's going on with that? Because that's where the coaching is. Okay, so um, what if we know their perception is it's not the truth? Well, yeah, so that's what we're going to exactly what we're going to help them see that it may not be the truth. That's the whole thing we're gonna work on. Okay. Um, 
what else do I want to say now? Um, the purpose of every question. Well, I said to you that the question should be something the client doesn't already know, right? So the purpose of every question is to force the client to think. You want them to think about something they haven't already thought about and that they don't know, like absolutely know. Like what happened in the conversation, they know what happened in the conversation. So we're trying to find out what we don't, what they don't already know, okay? Um, now, I have a theory just my theory, but again, based on experience, <laughs> that when you start the conversation, and this is going to be my by the way, <laughs> when you start the conversation, I hear people say, so what's been happening or how has your week been? That invites the story. We are trying to do everything we can to avoid the story. They're going to give us one anyway, but we don't want to be the one to invite it. So I like to start with, you know, what can we focus on that will be important for you? Or what can we focus on that will make a difference? Or what could we discuss that will uh, help you at this point in time? Or something that's really saying, hey, listen, we're, we're not going to have a chit chat here. And then if they want to share what they've been up to, that's fine. But I really want to get to the point. Pun pun intended. Okay, so I have a theory that whatever question we start with, they're going to give us the story, right? My boss was awful. I had a terrible day and this happened and then he did this and he did that and, that, 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 and I, I just, I don't know how I'm going to cope with this. I am going to say that the first question you ask after that story is the most important question of the whole conversation. And yes, I jumped right into it. Um, <laughs> so that was in the chat. Um, so the important thing after the story is that you reflect, not parrot. So I remember giving a talk and giving this example. The client says, I am so upset. I just found out my husband cheated on me. I'm freaked out. I don't know what this is going to mean for me. I don't know if it means I'm getting divorced. I don't know if I should share this with my children. And the coach says, so what would you like as an outcome for our conversation? Can you hear how disconnected that is? Or the other thing I hear is, so it seems as though you just found out that your husband cheated on you and now you're not sure what it's going to mean and blah, 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 parroting. That's not reflection. Reflection is your editorial of what you've heard. So it sounds like you've been blindsided and this is really disturbing for you. Can you hear that difference in that reflection? And then an open question. And an open question. And here's something that people get nuts with me about, but I'm okay with that because I still stick to it. <laughs> and that is every question should start with the word what? And then everybody says, really? We learn not to say why questions, but what? What about a how question? How questions are great. And I say, a how question goes to methodology. A what question opens up possibilities. So let's just look at this talk we're doing right now. How did you choose to, to come today? Well, I realized it was going to fit into my schedule. I need some CEUs, you know, whatever. What was it about this talk that had you come here? Well, I was excited to hear you speak because I was really wanted to learn more about this laser coaching, whatever. I'm going to get the information I need. So I am going to invite you to try. Oh, and I didn't say at the very beginning in my invitation, if you try something and it doesn't work, drop it. 
But if you try it and it works, keep going. So try what questions and see what happens because I will tell you unequivocally, the feedback I get every time I do this in a class, the feedback I get is, I can't believe what a difference that makes. So just be willing to try it. Now, how do you offer reflection without being judgmental? We'll get to that. But I am not being judgmental when I say, it's like the woman who was so disturbed about the husband thing. If I say, it sounds like you were blindsided and this is really disturbing. That to me is not a judgment, it's an observation. And that's a big difference. So we'll get to that. We'll get there. So I believe that we need to ask some probing questions before we get to the agreement. And I know everybody's so focused on we need the agreement, we need the agreement. Yes, you do, but not up front. Why? How many people can honestly say, that the way the conversation started and what the person asked for was exactly what happened by the end of the conversation. There's no such thing, it evolves. And as it evolves, you start to realize, oh my gosh, this wasn't about the boss. This is about her husband who has the same personality as her boss, right? Or whatever it is. You start to realize that it's not exactly what they're saying. It's like the woman who came about looking for the teacher for her, for her child. It had nothing to do with the price of beans. So you don't want to get an agreement until you figure out what this is really about. So a few questions before you actually say what would be helpful for the conversation. And I'm going to say, and I know people get nuts with me on this too. The, the question about measure of success is very jargony. Rather, if you have to ask that question, then ask what will it look like when it's the way you want it to be? Make, make, come up with a question that's just natural talking. Okay, we got that? <laughs> All right. Um, so here's... Um, uh, an example of something a client comes with. And I want you to hear then the bad question in quotes and then the better question, which is probably not a good way to say it, but you'll get the point. So the client comes and the client says, when I feel nervous in situations, I speak quickly and I don't come across as self-confident. I need ways to come across as self-confident. I don't want to lose my job. And now we think, why did the person tell us this? And what's making it a problem for this person? Those are the questions we're holding in mind. So when somebody asks, well, what does self-confident look like? It's not really, in quotes, a bad question but it's not the most powerful possibility. So listen to, um, what do you, it seems that how you come, that changing how you come across is important to you. That's my reflection. What do you think is creating the nervousness? So listen to that difference. Right? It seems that how you come across is important to you. What do you think is creating the nervousness? Can you see how I am going to make this person really think now? They know what self confident looks like. Oh, it's when the person has their act together. They can describe that. But what they haven't thought about is what is really making them so nervous. And as the coach, if I find out what it is, then we have something to work with. Okay. So I don't know. Am I so far? Are we good? Do we have questions? Do we have comments? Do we have thoughts? Do we have people wanting to say something? 
Everybody's good. Hi, Angela. <laughs> Anybody? Anything? Marion, you said that um, before the agreement, these are the questions, right? So are you covering now the, the agreement itself because the, the setting the stage in what's really important to the person with the probing questions that you said comes before in your explanation. So what about the agreement? I think you are going to talk about, but I want to confirm no, that. No, I wasn't going to get into it. Well, okay, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll get to you and, um, and Andre. So the agreement has to sound natural. And it never does. It always sounds like I'm following the ICF formula. What do you want from the conversation? You know, blah, 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 whatever people say, you know, what's a measure of success? And, you know, what do you want is the outcome? Oh, yeah. Now, what do you want is the outcome? Think about that. How many times does the client says, oh, I just want clarity or I just want to make a decision, but they can get so much more. So, to me, it's, it's, yeah, it doesn't quite work. So the questions that I like are things like, well, what makes this important for you? Or what do you think is going to help you to figure out, you know, whatever? Or what's making this a difficult decision? Things like that. So things that, you know, when you ask those probing questions in the beginning, you are starting the agreement because you're figuring out where we have to go. Okay, so um, yeah, Andre, you had, you had a question. I saw a hand raised. And I don't, Sorry, I, I, can you hear me? Yes. I, I don't know how I, I um, raised my hand. <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> okay. I do wanna say that uh, these tips that you're talking about, the, the stuff that you've gone through has been great because it, it, just, it, it just clarifies things a lot more than what I was, you know, like going through coach training and like getting into a regular practice. Mm -hmm. I think you lose sight of some of these really simple, simple concepts. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. Thank you for saying that. Okay. So um, I want to talk about um, direct communication, which is um, now unfortunately 7.11 um, only in the new competencies. And it was a separate competency. And to be honest, it was my absolute favorite. So, <laughs> and it's now only 7.11. I'm gonna share observations and feedback without comments and without, I uh, forget how it's worded exactly, but the bottom line is that's the only thing now that actually says direct communication. So I'm gonna say to you that you can actually say anything you want to say to your client. No matter what pops into your mind, you can say it. The key is how you do it. And I have three basic guidelines, okay? One is you're going to, observe, you're going to own your observation. In my opinion, the way I see this, in my, from my perspective, it seems as though that kind of language, like I am now going to own this as my perception. This is what I'm thinking. It may be true and it may not. And I'm, I'm fine with that, but I, want, I need to own this, that this is my thinking. So from my perspective, it seems like, or whatever the thing is, the second guideline, you don't use the word you. Because if you use the word you, it's accusatory. And I'm telling you something as if it's the truth. And I don't know that it's the truth. And I'll give you an example in a moment. And the third guideline is that you ask a mini question. So the client is talking about something and you say to yourself, oh, this is interesting. That person really does sound pretty pissed about it. How are you gonna say that to the client? 
but you're first going to own this. You know, as I'm listening, it seems as though there's some anger going on. What do you think? Now imagine if instead I said, you know, as I'm listening, you sound angry. Can you hear that huge difference? I don't use the word you. It's sometimes tricky and a little hard to phrase, but you can do it. If you practice, you can do it easily because I just think of it as talking in third person. So I'm going to own it. I'm going to put it out there without the word you. And then I'm going to ask a mini question. I am not going to ask a normal question that moves the conversation forward. I am asking a mini question to let the client respond to what I've shared because they may agree and they may not agree, right? I mean, I could be dead wrong and the client could say, you know what? I'm not angry. I think I'm just really frustrated. Well, that's fine. Now I have the information I need. That's, that's, that, you know, I don't have to be right. But I can't say you sound angry because that's me telling them that this is what's coming across in a way that they're going to want to say, oh my gosh, she thinks I sound angry. I didn't think I sounded, it's just going to create friction. So three guidelines for direct communication. One, talk about it from your perspective, the way you observe it. Don't use the word you and follow it with a mini question. What do you think? What's true about that? What comes up for you? What does that sound like? Any mini question is fine. Okay. Now, we're going to look at um, the shift because everybody said, look, you know, we all know the client, we want the client to have that aha moment. Well, I'm here to tell you that those aha moments are supposed to come throughout the conversation. It's not necessarily one big one. And the way they come is from your reflections because you're reflecting something they are not even realizing. Or you're doing direct communication and you're sharing something that they didn't notice or see. Okay, so let's look at some ways. Well, first of all, let me just say, in order to create the shift, they have to be in pain. Why do I even say that? Because if the client doesn't realize just how painful something is, that means their current situation, they're not motivated to do it differently because we can all get comfortable with pain. We can get comfortable with discomfort. We can get comfortable with it's not good, but I can kind of live with it. We can all get comfortable with that and be okay. But then we're not motivated to do anything differently. So we have to help them see just how bad their situation really is. And then they'll be motivated to do something about it. So one of the things I like to do is to ask them, what is it costing you? And I'm gonna, but not, but that's only the beginning part. So I'm gonna go back to an example I gave earlier. The, the person says, if I share my feelings, he will leave me, okay? And I might say, what is it costing you to hold back your feelings? Well, it, it doesn't feel authentic. I, I feel like I'm always stifling. I, I, you know, it takes up a lot of my energy, whatever. I promise you, absolutely promise, whatever they answer to that question, they already know that answer. And therefore, the key is, what else besides your energy, stifling your feelings, whatever they've said, what else is it costing you to hold back your feelings? And what do you think happens from that question? Everything flows out. Yeah, you get, the, you get to the bottom, you get to the real 
honest to God bottom introspective thing that's happening for them, right? You've, you've broken the dam. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. So the key is you ask it with the entire phrasing, not what is it costing you? What is it costing you to hold back your feelings? And then after they give you their laundry list, you repeat it. So besides da 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 da, what else is it costing you to hold back your feelings? The whole thing again, not what else? Because you really want to emphasize there's more, and I'm waiting for you to tell me what that more is. And that's how you get them to do it. So that's one way we can create the shift. Another way is what I call my exaggerated example. So I had, and I think I might've put this one in the book. Um, I had a woman who said, um, I was out with some very dear friends and um, she criticized my parenting. And I have to tell you, I am so pissed. I'm so insulted. I'm so hurt. Like, how could she do that? And I said to her, well, let me just ask you this question. If she had told you that she didn't like the way you did your hair, what would you think? And she said, she didn't like my hair. Uh, why do I care if she likes it or not? And I said, and what makes that any different from her opinion on your parenting? So I like to take an exaggerated example that mimics the same thing and have them see their faulty thinking. Okay. Another thing that I really love is what if you knew? And the what if you knew is usually like an opposite. So for example, we'll go back to the woman who didn't want to share her feelings. What if you knew that sharing your feelings was going to strengthen the relationship? What would that mean? Now, we don't know that it will strengthen. He might leave, right? We know that. But at least let's open the door because we want to help this person see that what they've been doing is extremely painful to keep holding back and that they need to do something different. So what if you knew? And then you, not that you're trying to convince them of something, then it doesn't work. But what if you knew, uh, almost like saying the opposite is true. What if you knew that this was going to work? Or what if you knew it wasn't going to work? Whatever their thing is. Okay. Another way is to remove the obstacle. People always say, well, I wouldn't have enough time to do that, right? I wouldn't have enough uh, energy for that. I wouldn't have enough, whatever. There's some obstacle in the way. And the example was, you know, I, I really want to work on my business. And I know I need to pay more attention to it, but I have so many doctor appointments. I just, I just don't have the time. And I said, what if you didn't have any doctor appointments? What would be different? And you know what I heard? <gasps> oh, then I'd have to work on my business. <laughs> so just know that when, the, when, when the, they're giving you an excuse and you're helping them see that's exactly what it is. Now, during COVID time, imagine someone saying, I don't have the time, right? And we can say to them, hey, listen, where are you going? You know, <laughs> you think you're running around and having a social life and, and, you know, going to meetings? I don't think so. You know, your home is Zoom. So think about, you know, how they put something in the way that's really just an excuse. Okay. Um, what would you like to work on today or focus on today? Yeah, that's okay. Not quite as strong as what can we look at that's really gonna make a difference for you or something in that vein. Okay. Um, and then of course, we're listening for the discrepancy or the disconnect, right? The thing that's not jiving. So I had a woman who's, who was talking about her 
her job and she said that I can see it's be going to become redundant and they're going to wipe out everything that I've been doing and it, I, it's unfortunate and I you know I really love this job but I can already see the handwriting on the wall so I really need to pick up on my uh, starting my own business and I've started but I need to do more with that because I can see the job is disappearing. About 15 minutes into the conversation she said you know, I just love this job so much and I just want to stay with it and I just want to keep it going. Wait a second. Not that long ago, I heard that it was going to become redundant and was going to be disappearing. What's really true? And that's when she had to admit, yeah, it, it is going away and I do have to give it up. So you get the point there. <laughs> okay, and so... Now what we're going to do, um, I am going to play, well, um, just before I play, um, let me just set this up. So you're going to be listening to an actual piece of a coaching conversation. And I know that there are going to be some real pushback comments around this because I've heard this many a time and I'm okay with that. And I can explain um, what happened in this conversation, but um, oh, I know what I didn't mention. And I'm really sorry that I didn't. Um, let me quickly do that first. Sorry. Is that, I, you know, I have come up with 25 themes Every, every, every coaching conversation has at least one theme in it. And so far, no one's been able to come up with a theme aside from the 25 that I've come up with. So every conversation has themes going on, like hardware store for milk. Like, why are you trying to get that from that person when they can't, they're just not capable of giving it to you? Or um, taking it personally, like it's always about you or the either or, right? Well, I can do it this way or I can do it that way. Well, no, there are other possibilities that either you haven't thought of or you can combine the two or, so there are gonna be themes that show up all based on self-esteem. That's what they're all based on. How do we really feel about ourselves? That's what comes out in everything they bring to us. And everything we think, it's really about what do we really think about ourselves? And think of any conflict you've ever had. And it's really based on who, who do I think I am, right? So there are themes like wherever you go, there you are. So I had somebody who said, well, I, I'm having such a problem meeting somebody. This was, you know, years ago. I'm having so much trouble meeting. I, I really want to find a relationship and meet someone, but it's not happening where I live. So I need to move somewhere else. Well, yeah, except wherever you go, there you are. And what I've heard is it's not the problem about meeting someone. It's you that's the problem, right? So people think that going someplace else is going to change things. Well, Yes, it might, but you know, it kind of depends. You're the common denominator taking it with you. So I'm just giving you some examples um, of some of the themes uh, carrying old messages. You know, people who have heard something as, as, as children, we hear all these messages from our, our peers, from our parents, from our teachers. And then we carry them with us as if they're still true. And now as adults, they don't have to be true anymore. So my point is that we're always listening for themes. And the reason that themes are so cool is because as soon as you hear a theme, and as I say, there could be more than one in a conversation, but as soon as you hear one, you know what question to ask. So when the person says, you know, well, I could do it this way or I could do it that way, and I'll say, what if there's something else possible? What else could be possible? Or what might be another option? Now they have to think, right? Because they're so stuck in this black and white. So there's so many, uh, as I say, so many of these themes um, that I think you can hear if you think about your, your conversations you've had with clients. 
if you look at this, the 25 themes, I think you'll see control, perfection, um, attached to the outcome, uh, authority. They, they're not doing it my way. I want them to do it my way. Yeah, well, and victim, right? Well, there was nothing I could do. I mean, I had no choice. There's always a choice. You may not like the choice, but there's always a choice. So there are all these different themes. And if you can catch them, you know what question to ask. Okay, so now let me set this up. <laughs> so, sorry, I digressed, but I, I realized I didn't put that in there. Um, so this was a coaching conversation. It was on a mentor call. So there were other people, so just so you know. And um, this was a coach who came and he said, I'm having a hard time because I'm working with a client. She's turning 30 and uh, she's not as far as long as she should be. And I think it's because I'm not doing great coaching. That's where it started. Okay. And then we had, I'm going to say about 10 minutes. And you're gonna hear what happens from that 10 minute point until just before the ending, okay? So you're gonna hear the, the main portion. And, um, and you'll notice that not every question started with the word what, um, because it was just in the moment and it just felt more appropriate, but that I still say, try it out. Okay, so let me, um, get this um, started. Let's see if I can get this right. Why is it not? Here it comes. I really do think it's because we're both turning 30 and I probably want to be farther along. Well, then I'm confused because based on what she's, what you've described about this woman, there's no comparison. So where, where is this coming from? So you heard he's also turning 30. That's really what the, the hang up was. Well, I think there is there is a comparison in the sense that we're both turning 30 and I want her to feel good turning 30 and I want myself to feel good turning 30. So that's the, what I'm seeing is how I'm comparing. Okay, so let's take her out of the picture. So okay. what's up with you not feeling good about turning 30? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I guess I thought I'd be in a relationship by now. Um, I am just now paying off like the business debt. So our business is doing really good. The debt's finally paid off. And now I'm like unsure of how much money to take out of the business. And so I just feel a little bit unstable. Whereas at 30, like I thought I'd feel more stable. Um, but I am talking to a finance person that's helping with all of that to figure out what's realistic to be able to take out of the company now that all the debt's paid off. Um, so yeah, I think it has to do with the business growth, being, being in a relationship, thinking I'd have a relationship by now. Um, and Yeah, I think I just all the expectations I put on being 30 when it's all not real. <laughs> so what is it about 30 that's so special? Um, <laughs> I think I had this idea that I'd have everything figured out by 30, that like, be with somebody I'd be 
being able to buy a place, I would be able, like I'd have stability. Like I looked at 30 as like, oh my gosh, kind of not like really the growing's done, but it's life becomes more stable. And, um, and I don't think that that's it yet, which I know is unrealistic because 30 is still young. <laughs> I'll say. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So, what if you knew that what you're describing is more like fifty rather than thirty? What difference would that make? <laughs> um, that's interesting. That's a weird thought that just came up. Um, that then I'm just, I guess, normal, or then I'm just, I didn't, like, achieve more than what's possible. Like, I, I don't know, I think I have my expectation on myself to, like, go above and beyond. Really? And I don't want to wait till 50. <laughs> mm -hmm. And where is that all coming from? And I thought I had worked through some of the stuff, but what's coming up is proving myself, like feeling like I have to prove myself. To whom? That's the thing. I have no idea. <laughs> I guess, obviously, myself. Uh, but yeah, I, there's, this, there's this belief that like I, there's always more and nothing's ever enough. And I'm always striving for more and more and more. Where does that uh, come from? That's the third time. Yes, I've been doing it my whole life. Um, interesting. Yeah, it comes from just feeling different my entire life and always having to prove myself and make myself worthy, kind of worthy, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, starting back in, yeah, I mean, elementary, or, uh, yeah, elementary school with friends. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, throughout my whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what if you knew that different or not different you're totally fine what what would that do for you <laughs> give me you i feel like a part of me does know that um <laughs> yeah but let's talk about the part that doesn't yeah That's the one percent. Yeah, I'm putting a lot of like my success is my relationship status, and then my success is my business is growth. And so that's the definition of success is having a solid relationship and my business making a million dollars. And you and know, like I, no, go ahead. That happened. And, it, and I feel not successful until it happens. So if you ask me, it sounds pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. So what what would what comes up just hearing that 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 to me sounds very sad. Yeah, because then it's, I'm never happy where I am until right. that happens, and then. And then it's something outside of myself instead of just having happiness inside of me. It sounds like that's been missing since early childhood. Yeah. So what's going to help you to feel okay about who you are?
Um, I don't know. Well, it's releasing the need for a relationship, like and like that making me whole, like that being success. Um, so really loving and being happy with me. Um, <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> So in order to be in a successful relationship, one has to love oneself first. So what do you think yeah. about that? Yes, and I feel like I do love myself more than ever. And from reflecting from our questions. <laughs> uh. Well, if that were really true, then seeking a relationship or seeking more money or something wouldn't really be the end all be all. Right. Yeah. So what does that mean then? Yeah, I want to disconnect that being success for sure. I don't want that to be the end all be all. Okay. So what's going to help you do that? I feel blank. <laughs> I mean, I want to say focus on what I have and be grateful for what I have, but that just feels empty. love to just stop thinking that but I don't know how I guess um so it's interesting I feel right now like embarrassed that I'm taking up a lot of time that I'm the center of attention Mm -hmm. And it, so why that's important is because I'm allowing myself to be present with me. I'm allowing my, like, allowing people to hold space for me. So mm -hmm. that feels good is, and is emotional, uh, space for people so much. Um, so I guess it's that creating space for me and for myself. <laughs> um, really listening to myself and creating opportunities to be with myself and to not be working, not be looking for a relationship, really just being with me and having fun with me and connecting mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. It sounds pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And what will that feel like? What will that look like? Uh, slowing down, not having my days completely packed full. Um, Like even my workouts and meditations, it's like all fitted into a schedule <laughs> that I'm like rushing through. Um, so slowing down. Be more present. I want my get in the way of that. Uh, 
um, <laughs> the fact that I have like over a hundred clients and have other people in the business that are depending on me. That's just an excuse because I made time for so mm -hmm. make me a priority. So that's just an excuse. Mm -hmm. And not using that. Yeah. Just repeating myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we started, this was about the client and her success mm -hmm. in a conversation or you having expectations. So where are things at this point? Um, well, I knew there was projection on her, but I didn't know how deep it went. So I appreciate that. And yeah, it has nothing to do with her. I know that I supported her a lot. Um, and it was perfect for her. Where, she, um, And so for me, <laughs> it's just a huge reminder that I thought I was doing really well for self-care and taking time for myself. And that was a lie. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I need to stop using like my business and relationship excuses for getting to know myself and connecting with myself. Mm -hmm. And I need to stop being ashamed for having stuff. Like I get to grow too. Um, so I think I should already be there but I get to go through my process as well. So basically you get to be a human being like the rest of us. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And that's really all people want. Mm -hmm. That's right. So is there somebody or something that can help you as you figure out how to, or as you really do slow down or stop these crazy expectations? Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, okay, so now um, Okay, so and your question he mentioned shouldn't what was that about? I don't remember where that was. Um, he, he just said should too. So it's should and shouldn't and it's I think it's avoidance, you know. I don't know that shoulds or shouldn'ts are good words to use. No, I agree. I agree. But he did, he did shift. And by the next time uh, he reported that he really had changed how he was approaching things and that he mm -hmm. really was taking time and so on. And that's what it sounded like to me. I mean, that was enough for one conversation. Now you also have to understand the beginning was maybe 10 minutes, maybe less. And this was 15 minutes. And you can see how deep it went in 15 minutes. And then of course there was just the ending. So you can do a really deep conversation in a half an hour without sweat. Okay, so I'm open now to two things. Number one, commenting on what you've heard and asking questions. So go. <laughs> I just wanted to say, Marion, I, um, well, I found that a little bit painful to listen to, just like imagining I'm the client, um, but your use of space and silence was extraordinary. I don't have that skill yet. I really, really try, but that's okay. the, like you said, that's the best coaching tool and that it is, there's no doubt. Okay. I find that in the times I do be quiet and listen and let silence take over, after I give them enough space, they'll answer. And then sometimes I won't even ask what else. I'll just let them sit with their answer and 10 seconds of silence. And then they'll go essentially like, okay, here's what it really is. <laughs> yeah. So what is it that makes you think, I mean, that doesn't sound true that you don't have this. It's, you know, when you think about it, think about it in this way, silence is the easiest and the hardest. It's the easiest because literally you don't have to do anything except sit back. That, that to me, I mean, I just sit back and like, wait, you know, see what they have to say. Yeah. The hardest because we want to jump in so badly. 
but why? Why jump in when they're going to give us all this stuff? Yeah, don't do the heavy lifting. Let them do exactly. it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. That's true. I found out the hard. I wouldn't say the hard way. I was actually in uh, a conversation with a client, and I was trying so hard to come up with the, like Hermie said, the right question, and I just couldn't think of one, and so I was quiet for to me seemed very uncomfortable and then the client just started going and and yeah. she told me later she says thank you so much for giving me that space and I'm thinking whoo I totally <laughs> blew it but I didn't <laughs> no no you know we have to understand when the client is sharing with us they're emotionally involved in whatever they're sharing. We are completely detached. Like, okay, you had a bad day with your boss, whatever, you know, but they're like all in it. So they need space. They need to process. They need to think about, they need to reflect. They need that space. Yeah. Okay. What else? Questions, comments. I am, um, Marion, I really appreciated how you, it didn't ignore, but like didn't get into his story about his client and her success and went straight to his personal feelings around being 30, because obviously he started with that. And if we had asked the typical quote of creating the agreement at that point, it would have been all about that. And exactly. it, it, so that was really masterful to, to witness how you drill down about him because it's never the why it's the why behind the why. Right. And so you, that was a good example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because my first questions were about, you know, his coaching and trying to figure out like where, where is he even coming up with this idea that he's not doing good coaching. But when I heard he was also turning 30, I was like, whoa, I know where we're going now. <laughs> Let's take that client out of this picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Well, I... Go, go, ahead, go. No, I just wanted to share that usually we, we believe that the agreement has to be done in the first five to 10 minutes. And really the agreement takes most of the session because once you finally get to the root, then you can see where you're gonna go with it. If you close it too soon, then you, you fe the fear is what happens, which is staying in in the story. So mm -hmm. allow yourself that time to, to go deeper and deeper because you should take like the first 20 minutes just to really reach the agreement. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and sometimes that's what it does take a long time, you know, and to ask somebody, what do they, what do you want from the conversation? What do you want from the conversation? It is so frustrating for a client who really doesn't know what they want because they haven't really explored whatever they're sharing with you. So yeah, the agreement has to wait. Okay, what else? Questions? Well, I'm in. Oh wait, I think Anastasia, did you have something you would? Yes, add? she did. Okay. Anastasia. Yes, I was gonna say how you started with going deeper versus broader, and that's exactly what you're doing in the session. You keep going. Where is this coming from? You mentioned three times until you start getting to him saying worthy, you know, I don't feel uh, uh, proved that he needs to prove himself. And then I love how you also use at, le at least twice here. What if you knew, right? This, uh, this, uh, mm -hmm. tool told us. so mm -hmm. that, was, that was really nice to see. Okay, good. Anne? Yes. Um, and uh, do you, do you get to um, real pain when you do you keep going till there's real pain or do you um you know where where it's been there for many years it's not going to come out just in you know a half hour um how do you um really go go deeper in a way that he can really get to the root well in this case okay so we we have to be careful we're not doing therapy right and, and when we go into the past, it, it has the potential to be therapy versus coaching. So my, my way of staying out of therapy is um, you can dip into the past, like find out what that root is. My teacher told me, my mother said, my father did, right? Whatever that root is. And then the next question has to be, 
okay, now as an adult, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it has to be about the present moment. And you never ask another question about the past. Once you get it, he felt different. His whole life, he felt different. That was all I needed to then bring him now into now and help him see that he's fine the way he is now and that he doesn't need to be further ahead or whatever he thought he had to be. So mm -hmm. you can dip. I, I thank you so much for that because when you did that, it didn't go into his shame and, and make him feel bad. You really, it was, it was brilliant. So I really thank appreciated you. how you did that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Questions, I mean, it could be about anything. It could be about what happened in this demo. Well, it wasn't a demo, it was an actual conversation. Yes, Suli. Yeah, hi. Um, when you were talking, I didn't hear you saying it's my perception or my observation. Yeah, I did. I did when I said, uh, to me, this sounds pretty sad. Yeah, in the beginning, but oh, that was that wasn't the beginning. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. No, okay. I was thinking if I was doing my PCC mm -hmm. and when the questioning that way, would I pass it? <laughs> when you're questioning what way? The way that we question and following the different uh, competencies. It was just a question to see if okay. I conducted myself in in that manner. Yeah, I think it, it gets tricky with PCC only because yeah. it looks very formulaic. Yeah. And people are so hung up on making sure they hit their points. And that's what makes it, in my opinion, bad coaching. So if you think about yeah, not, focusing, not focusing on PCC, focus on MCC. That's what I, oh, I mean, I, when I teach, I, in the first lesson, they're already learning how to separate the person from the story, literally in the first lesson, because you want to know what MCC is supposed to be like and sound like versus settle for PCC, which has all these little criteria that could make a person nuts. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, doing what you did is actually the art of coaching, yeah. And, you know, following 3.1, 4.2, it takes away from your ability to really be an impactful and go deep. So, yeah, but if you go back now and look at those um, markers, you'll see there was presence, there was um, direct communication. Uh, yes. Yeah. Was, yeah. All they were there, but I never thought about them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, is that is that okay, enough of an answer, Suli? Yes. Okay. And thank so, you. This was really great. Thank good. You. All right. So Claire, your question is um, sounds pretty sad. Seems a bit judgmental. Yeah. So it wasn't a judgment only because I said to me it sounds kind of sad. What does that mean when you hear that's what I'm thinking? I said something. You know, I'm paraphrasing now, but that's pretty much what I said. So he could have easily said so, you know, something completely different. Now, I could have also said, you know, what you're describing is more like a 50 year old. And at your age, it doesn't even seem remotely realistic from what I'm hearing, you know? So I could have done it in a really soft way, so to speak, and still get that same thing across. But with the rapport and everything, um, you know, people know that's my style. I'm going to just put it out there, what I'm thinking. Um, and to be honest, uh, um, the word I really wanted to use was pathetic, but that I wouldn't have done. But I did think, you know, to be 30 and to think that you're supposed to have a million dollars and be in a relationship and have your life all together. To me, that's, you know, at my age now, I look, you know, at somebody 30 who's like a baby and say, Mm, I don't think so. That's, that's pretty sad. <laughs> and I thought that it was wrecking him. That's what his, his, um, he thought was true, right? That's what he thought was true. And that's the part where I didn't, I had to help him see that it really wasn't realistic. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So I, I hope that helps to say that it wasn't so judgmental. Thank you. 
Okay, anyone else before we have to close down? Anyone? Questions, comments, thoughts? So uh, I will make a comment, Marion, because uh, what you said here, and I was checking the book, is page 102, is about the themes. Because before the demo, you mentioned the themes, right? And uh, really having that in mind is helpful to, to build the challenge that we want to. Because there, there is always the, the number of stories or the main themes, as you said, right? Which is... Uh, helpful to the coach and say, mm, it seems that. So we kind of have, I'm going to use the hammer or the screwdriver or something and feel comfortable in what tool to use in, and just be present, you know, it, that's the mastering. If, even if yeah. we were had demands of using the tools at that moment, because we saw that before, right? Mm -hmm. And having the themes uh, as you present in the book is really helpful. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I find them to be like I used to when I when I had them before my book was out and people in the class would get the themes. I made them like almost sign a paper that they would never share them with anybody because they I thought they were just so <laughs> amazing to have them mm -hmm. because once you have them, the questions are so much easier. You just know what to do because and you pick up on things so much faster. You don't have to get into the story because you can hear, oh my God, this person has it like I have to do this or that. And that's not true. Or, oh my gosh, this person's the victim. They I have to help them see they do have choices. Or mm -hmm. this person, you know, is taking it personally. I have to help them see it's not really about them. You know, whatever it is, it just helps me right away to know where I'm going. And even if it winds up being another theme that comes up, that's fine but at least it helps me in that moment. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else, anything? Yeah. Anne, will you? Yeah, what um, theme would you put with the, if you find somebody that's um, uh, maybe right, maybe wrong, but never in doubt? What do you mean by maybe right, maybe wrong, but never in doubt? They're, mean, never, in, they're, they're never in doubt about what they say is, is, is so. You know, it's just, it's absolutely true. What they say, they, authority. and they don't take any, there's no humility there. You know, it's authority. And, and ironically, victim and authority are completely connected. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as being authoritative and never feeling like I have no choice, I have no power. They go together. Mm -hmm. it, it's really intriguing, but they do. Um, so that person who always thinks I've got it, I, I can guarantee there are plenty of times where I have no idea can come up also. You know, it, you. it's those extremes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, anyone else, anything before we? Oh, oh. I just want to say thank you so much. And I think now everybody are really excited about getting the book and <laughs> digging deep in all of those uh, gold, gold mine advices and especially the themes and everything that you covered today. Um, it was incredible. I think we, we do have a lot of questions, but... Uh, well, you can always email me, really, email me. And if you do have the book and you've read the book, please put a um, testimonial on Amazon. And okay. um, Angela is actually mentioned in my book. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And um, <laughs> we are very, very excited that you were able to make it and very grateful for this time and the wisdom that we heard from you. Thank, Thank you, Marion. Thank you. Our community is better because of this type of interactions. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.